Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Creative Podcast. I am Brian Hood, and I'm here with my big, bald, beautiful co-host, Christopher J. Graham. How are you doing today, my dude? I'm fantastic. I'm having a wonderful, wonderful day, but I don't want to talk about it, Brian. I want to talk about your day. Honestly, <laughs> for being fully transparent, both our days were like, we got on this, we got on this call today and we're like, this sucks. Everything sucks today. I hate today. And then we started going through our like pre-show checklist and like going through our systems and like brought us back on track and now we're energized. And we started playing with this new toy online, this like vocal thing that we're going to talk about later in this, in this interview where we literally had a competition to see who had a higher vocal range. You had how many octaves, Chris? Three, three, three octaves, three measly octaves on your vocal range. Meanwhile, the incredible Brian Hood, they, they call me four octave Brian because I can hit four octaves with my <laughs> voice. So actually not even that, the, the tool we were trying it on couldn't even register my highest note. That's how high it was. It was like, <laughs> we don't even know what note this is. And that's, that's where it's I was probably because so, that tool had some artistic taste. And <laughs> it sounded, no, we're not talking about tone. We're talking about pitch. And that's <laughs> what I want on today. Not, we're not talking about tone. So let's talk about, let's read this. We, we've got a guest on the show today. His name is Matt Ramsey. He is a, uh, I don't know how to explain him other than a vocal coach, YouTube sensation superstar with over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, millions, over 9 million views on YouTube, which is like, I can't even comprehend that. Like, I don't, we're not that popular, Chris. We just get like, we have our little piddly podcast. He's genuinely helped thousands of people around the world as a vocal coach. And we want to pick his brain on a few things around his business. So Matt, welcome to the show, my dude. Thank you guys so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, man. Yes. Yes. We're excited to have you on here as well. So that one, of the, one of the fun things about shifting to the Six Figure Creative Podcast, and, and now that we've kind of gotten to the rhythm of things a little bit and interviewed some different guests, is getting people from a wide variety of different backgrounds that we re- really, we never could have interviewed if we just stuck to the Six Figure Home Studio, which was our old mm. podcast or the old season, whatever you want to call it. And so it's fun to get someone like you on because I've never really ever talked to a vocal coach. I clearly am not a singer or else my we would have been talking about tonality instead of pitch on this little war that Chris and I had. Clearly never had vocal lessons. Don't need them because I I would be awful. It'd be a waste of time. But I don't need them either, but only because I was born with raw talent. That's right. Get out of here. Incorrect. (laughs) No, incorrect. No, but you have a really cool business. You have a cool business model. And we wanted to to, to bring you on the podcast to highlight some of the cool things that you're doing on here. Yeah. Well, another thing too that I think is so interesting about this episode is because your business is so hyper-focused on like you are selling customer service. It's, Hey, come hang out with me and we'll talk. Right. And I relate with that. Like I'm a, I'm a business coach. That's my main, my main uh, gig right now. More on that later folks. <laughs> but because you focus on customer service as a job, you're going to inherently understand things about being a creative freelance entrepreneur who provides a service to a client that other people won't have as much as you do. And, I think the beautiful thing, we've talked about this before, is that there's a fellowship of creatives, that creatives as a whole, we all work in these weird little niches, and it's a really spread out fellowship because creative people are creative and they come up with weird business ideas of like, I could teach people how to sing for a living. I could master music for a living. I could make guitar pickups for, you know, there's so many different random creative paths that you could take, but there were still a fellowship of creatives. And when you listen to another creative story about how they grew the crap out of their business, it's inspiring for us as creatives. And it also helps us learn some tips and tricks along the way. So on that note, Matt, I'd actually like to chat about what led you to becoming a vocal coach. Because so many people have these creative skills, something they're great at, that they have maybe thought about monetizing, but they haven't really taken that leap of faith to do it. So what even got you into vocal coaching in the first place? Yeah, dude, it's a crazy story. So just a little background on me. So I actually went to school for advertising. Uh, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University for advertising because, you know, talking to my parents, I'd always played music, but I was like talking to my parents. I was like, okay, so I want to find this career that's like going to pay me well, but where I can be creative. And so, you know, talk to my parents and my teachers and they're like, maybe you should try this advertising thing. That might be interesting. Well, I somehow managed to do four years of advertising school and without the realization that I would absolutely hate it once I started (laughs) Doing. That's what good advertising does. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the real, yeah, they, I was the real client there. They, yeah. they were really just selling their advertising <laughs> school to me. Actually, VCU has a great advertising school and it really taught me to, to think in terms of concepts and to think in terms, like it taught me to be a, a much better writer as well. Mm. So I went to school for, for copywriting, graduated, had no, no big plans. I actually wanted to go to graduate school for, for advertising because they had this, uh, 
graduate program there that they pretty much guaranteed that you would get a job. This was 2008, 2009. So, uh, Which was a those, great time to, great to graduate. Great time to be college. a graduate. <laughs> so I ended up waiting tables for that summer in between graduation and everything. And I was waiting tables at the Jefferson Hotel. I had this, this little breakfast shift that I was doing. And one of my tables, they had all of these charts and graphs and everything and, and some creative work that they were you know, talking about. And I was like, oh, what do you guys do? And they're like, we're in advertising. And I was like, well, I don't know if you guys accept interns, but I'm your next guy. And they were from San Francisco. Long mm. story short, we followed back up and I was very persistent. They brought me out there to be their first ever intern. And that began the three worst months of my life. <laughs> <laughs> because... It was, you know, when you're a creative person, as you guys are and as all of your listeners are, it's difficult sometimes to always be creative on demand for other people and, and not, get mm. a, not get to put your name on anything. You know, if you're a producer, you do get to, to put your name in the credits on, on the album or, or whatever. Or maybe you get listed, you know, on the, on the Spotify information. But when you're in advertising, literally everything belongs to... First, it belongs to the creative director who you're reporting to. Then it eventually belongs to the client. And so I was like putting in these 12 to 14 hour days. And at the end of it, I was not hired, decidedly not hired by them because I was a terrible intern. My director was basically like, you know, I feel like you're this guy that likes to talk a lot about doing stuff, but I didn't actually see you do a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> And <laughs> what would you say you do here? Exactly. It's like, <laughs> oh, we're going to need you to come in on Saturday. <laughs> and so it, it really got the wheels turning because I was like, OK, here's this thing that I thought that I was absolutely, absolutely going to love. And here's this guy who knows better, who tells me, oh, you know what? This thing that you like talking about, you're not so good at it. And I, I really thought about uh. like, well, why am I not? Because I'm a very self-driven person. Why am I not doing this? And so that began this little period of unemployment that I had when I was living in San Francisco. And so for the first time, I was like, well, if I can do anything, what do I want to do? Like, I know what the worst case scenario is. I mean, there's way worse case scenarios than that. As a creative person, you know, being creative for other people, not feeling appreciated or validated or, or making the money that you want or whatever it is, that is, you know, for a lot of people, a worst case scenario. And so I was like, well, I've always you know, been playing music and I've always wanted to, to be a performer. And so I was like, I'm going to do that. So I started playing in the train stations and at all the coffee shops and taking every and all the open mics, every every gig that I could. And after about like an hour of playing in the train stations, my voice would be totally blown out, just like gone. And it's because I didn't really know how to use my voice correctly. And so I started asking around about a vocal coach. And I got put in touch with one. Long story short, I ended up moving to Austin, Texas, because I found a great voice teacher here. Now, there were so many other reasons I went into that decision. But part of it was like, I found this great vocal coach here. And I was like, well, at least that settled. Like, I love this guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So I started taking voice lessons with him. And after about a year, he was like, you know, you figured out what I was doing with all these, you know, crazy exercises. Why don't you just start teaching this? And I was like, no way, man. I'm going to be on a tour bus selling gold records. I'm going to be doing the whole rock and roll thing. I was like, no, I had no, no desire to teach. But I decided to just give it a try. And so I started teaching a couple of my friends for free. And I absolutely loved it. And I think that this is the crazy thing for creatives, too, is that, you know, you can think through all these decisions, but you don't know until you actually start doing something how you really feel about it. And once I started doing it, I mean, it was like all of the creative energy that I had just really, really went into that. And I just wanted to be the best possible teacher that I could. So in the very beginning, it was about, you know, trying to figure out how to be the best possible teacher, what all of the, the pedagogy and what, what exercises do what and what kind of voice types people are and what songs fit people's voices. And then very quickly, I started to kind of get a hang for the marketing part of it, too. And that was really, really transformational. That's awesome. One of the things you said really jumped out to me because Brian and I have talked a lot about the angle for this new podcast season, you know, whether we should focus on how soul sucking a bad job can be or whether <laughs> we should focus on the upside of like, do you have any idea how fun it is to own your own business and get to do whatever you want, whenever you want and build whatever you want with whoever you want. But what I would say to, to your previous intern employer 
that struck me that he told you, you know, it seems like you like to talk a lot, but I've never se- seen you really do anything. <laughs> you want to be like, he didn't say never seen you do anything. He's like, you don't seem to be doing this a whole lot. Well, what I would say to him is like, sir, what is it that you believe an advertising agency does? <laughs> that's the that's the whole point of the advertising agency is to talky, talky, talky and not do the dewey. <laughs> like, I'm not personally a huge fan of advertising agencies, though. I probably will change my mind someday on that. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's a great story, man. Well, the and world I, the world has changed so much. And yeah. so we're talking we're talking about creatives and, and marketing and promotion and the world has changed when i went to college it was all about okay thinking in terms of like one single ad you've got an image you've got a headline you've yeah. got a tagline and you've got the logo that's the entire space with which you can create and of course there's radio and tv and all this other stuff and interactive was just getting started and was becoming a big thing but even still like the education at that time was like very very focused on this one thing and now it's like, well, you guys know, you know, you have a, a fantastic website. I'm sure you guys know your, your way around SEO and maybe mm. a, even some paid digital advertising. It's like there's not a whole lot of spaces where you just see that one kind of generic image headline kind of ad anymore. It is fantastic to start thinking in that way in terms of like, what is my service? What makes it unique? How can I position it in a way that that people will find interesting? There's so much value in that as a creative person, but the execution has changed so much since since those days. Now it's like it could be a Facebook ad. It could be we're going to talk about it in a second. I'm sure it could be, you know, a rangefinder app or it could be an app that you create or something like that that really connects with people. I think our audience can kind of resonate with the story you told, at least to some degree, or a lot of our audience where they're stuck in a, a day job they may or may not love. They may hate they may or may not agree with the fact that it's poisoning their creativity, which I think if it's a soul sucking day job, I don't know how you can be a creative in a job like that, but some people persist and, and they thrive in, despite that. Well, submission but, and creativity are not great bedfellows. Right. You know? Yeah. So what I, want to, what I want to chat about now, though, is you talked about the transition to you were working for some of your friends for free, teaching them vocal coaching. You discovered mm-hmm. this kind of new, newfound passion for, for teaching this, this, this skill that you have. and from there, there has to be a lot of steps, a lot of challenges to actually turning it into a full-time income. Like, how did you transition from like, I can dabble in this. I'll work with some friends. This is fun. I have some good, a good passion on this. I'm pretty good at it. Now, how do I actually monetize this? What was that, what was that transition like to full-time? Man, those are, that's a, such a great question. Just to touch on one thing that you mentioned earlier, that the, the hatred that you feel for your soul-sucking job, if you can in any way turn that into fuel that you use to pursue Mm. this new thing. That is just such an amazingly powerful thing to do. If you can, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can just talk about it. You actually have to start doing this. You actually have to start seeing what it's going to be like, or else you could be, you know, abandoning the old, you, you might in the future be like, oh, wow, that was such a cushy job. I had a great salary and benefits. What am I doing here now? Which happens to a lot of people as well. Golden handcuff is what we call that. The golden the golden handcuffs. handcuffs imprison many, many people. Absolutely. Absolutely. But to actually start to, to make an income from it was very, very slow at first. It, at least it seemed slow for me because I actually went back to waiting tables. Um, so I had this nice advertising internship that promised to turn into a career. And then I went right back to waiting tables, almost like completely ignoring the fact that I had a degree and all this stuff, which mm. doesn't mean anything, of course. You know, I started teaching my friends at the same time as I was waiting tables. And it took another like four years to build up to the point and build my studio to the point that I was like, okay, I'm finally supporting myself enough from this other thing that I can completely leave this thing. And even at that point, by the way, it was still a risk. I still only had like, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars in my bank account. And I was like, well, that'll buy me like two months of rent. You know, you're doing these calculations. Yeah. If the worst happens, how long do I have before my landlord kicks me out? (laughs) Dude, yeah. Taking off those golden handcuffs, man, it feels so risky when you're doing it. That's that's a pun for those who are as mad at Chris as I am. He's our pun, our pun daddy here. I've been working on that for like four minutes. (laughs) 
I'm going to cut off our guest to <laughs> insert myself into this pun uh, opportunity here. That's that's Chris. All right, so let's let's talk about this. You said it was, a, it was four years of of struggle, pain. Like, what were some of the things that you learned in that four year period of transitioning from this is essentially a hobby that I'm doing for friends because I'm doing it for free, yeah, to getting my first client or clients to actually scaling it up to full time? What were the things that that helped you in that transition? Yeah. So at first, I did something really stupid, which was that I I actually contacted, I'm not going to say the name of the service, but I contacted a digital coupon service and said, hey, you know, I'm a vocal coach. I would love to put together some sort of a package where people can buy my services and we can come up with some sort of a deal. And they're like, great. Well, okay. So you're charging, you know, let's, I think at that time I was like $40 an hour or something. They're like, great. Okay. What we need to do is we make a deal where you charge $15 an hour and we, we sell these packages up for up to like three months or something like that. It was incredible. It was an incredible deal. And thank you to all the people that took lessons with me at that point. So I sold, I think there were like 200 of them sold. So all of a sudden I had like 200 students and I was making like this, like less or the same amount of money that I was at my waiting tables job. But I'll tell you something, you get really, really good at your job really quickly uh, with that level of volume. So I think that if I'm, if I can consider myself a quality coach, it's probably those early those early days where I was teaching a ton of people for next to nothing. And it was, they were some of the the most fun people because you got all these folks that had no desire to be a singer whatsoever. And they're like, well, that's fun. I see that. I've got my credit card right here. Why not? So that was an early mistake. That was a big mistake. Would um, you call it a group C? I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Almost like a coupon for groups. And the word oopsie combined into one word. Yeah. Oh, Groopsy. My- God, Chris, that's the <laughs> worst one you've ever had. And with a guest too. It's one thing when it's just me and you, Chris, and you can do a pun and I can cut it out later, but we have a guest here and you just killed his vice. He's like, I'm never coming on this. I'm never for like four it. people, that was the best part of the podcast we've had yet. So <laughs> it's right. okay with me. And everyone else cut it off. So let's let's get back on track here with, with our, our wonderful Tell guest. Tell us your Matt. thoughts at sixfigurecreative.com. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So, so that was an early mistake, but then what was really, really... I think a big thing for me, and, and I know that this is, this is going to sound really obvious, but SEO. SEO is a huge, huge deal for my business. And I actually had a couple of students that were like, they had a, a background in marketing and they were like, hey, you know, let me start working on some SEO for you. We'll trade for lessons. And that was one of the best decisions that I ever made. And mm. you know, if, there's, if there's something that you can take from this, certainly with a, with a service like voice lessons or even production or mixing or recording studios, you know, having a uh, good search engine optimization so that as soon as someone searches, you know, mixing studio Austin or voice lessons, Austin, singing lessons, Austin, that you're the first thing that pops up or you're at least quite high. That was an absolute turning point night and day for my business. And I regret all of the time that I spent chasing down. I mean, I did the Facebook ads thing. It was like nothing was panning out, but SEO was the first really big money move mm. uh, that I made for my business. So let's talk about the SEO thing. Cause yeah. I, 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 I mean, you have a large YouTube presence and that seems to be a very large factor to your success as well. So the, the whole content marketing thing, that's the kind of the direction I had in my mind for this interview in my notes here. Sure. But I wasn't aware that SEO was such a large driver in, in your uh, business. And I'm sure, I mean, a lot of these things go hand in hand because Google's the second biggest search engine in the world. I'm sorry, YouTube is the f- second biggest search engine in the world. And then first is obviously Google. Exactly. But what were some of those early things that you were doing in SEO to help get your business have that, you know, get the night and day difference in your marketing efforts? Sure, sure, sure. Well, just to touch on what you said, the YouTube thing is big now, but there's also like six plus years of work that went into growing that to where it is. And now it's kind of just, you know, self-fulfilling thing where you it's mean just, you weren't just an overnight YouTube sensation. You know, I, I look at other creators like Rick Beato and I'm like, yeah. his, his first video ever has like over a million views. And like, I, that's like the only person that I know of that like he did the YouTube thing and it was like immediate. And, you know, I don't have a child with perfect pitch, which <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen the video, but his oh, son oh, Dylan. Oh, yes. His son I, Dylan I, I, has My perfect kids pitch. are about the same age as his kids. Yes. When that video came out and I was like. And your kids mm-hmm. can do the same thing, right? Oh, of course. They totally. Can. Results not typical. So Rick is, is an inspiration to us all, but. Also, you got to look at how much he posts and the, the quality of his posts. Yeah, it's very are just high. insane. But to go back to the SEO thing, so, you know, having an expert there who has a history and a background and doing some of the really kind of 
nitpicky plugin oriented stuff because I use a WordPress site. Other people who are listening to this use Wix or Squarespace, what have you. There's a no, little less optimization. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, so having having someone with a, a background in s sort of the more kind of like, uh, you know, ones and zeros stuff on the back end of your site is really, really helpful. And, and just simple things like optimizing your images. Like, you know, I think my original homepage had like a video pop up is the very first thing is when mm. you went there. And I think I even saw that on, on one of your all sites. And that's a fantastic thing if you have a really, really good host and all that stuff. But it was slowing my site. My site would take like 15 seconds to load, 15 to 20 Ooh, seconds to load on the first you. one. And, and Google does not like that. Google likes yeah. her results Sub two fast. Second. Yep, yeah, exactly. She likes her results fast. She likes them now. And she likes them pretty. So if you can find somebody that has those skill sets, if this is a situation that you're in where you're a creative and you're trying to trying to grow your business and SEO you think is going to help you, then that is definitely a good thing to do is find somebody who has some experience doing it. Look out because there's a lot of shysters. I was about there. to ask, how do you avoid the shysters? Because if I look up SEO experts, there's like 50 that I can find right this second. And, and ironically, the good ones rank high. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you Actually, know, it's not ironic. You're just going to pay a ton of money for yeah. SEO expert, whoever ranks top of SEO expert on Google. I just mean like, I'm, I'm assuming the person you work with, Matt, was somebody in your local area, somebody you had connections with, either a referral from a friend or someone that you coached with your vocals yourself. Like, how did you find this person and how do you actually uh, qualify them to make sure they're not going to ruin your site or rip you off or do something even worse than, than what you had before? Yeah, it, so it's ironic. So I was at that point where I was like, I have $1,500 in my bank account. Is now the time to quit my waiting tables job? And I decided, yes, this is the time I'm going to do this. And I had all of that horrible experience with that, the coupon site. And I started actually working at a local music school for an embarrassingly low hourly rate. But the studio owner, it's called Eastside Music School, by the way, and I'm forever grateful to Alex, who's the owner there, because he was like, you know, you're trying to grow your business. I'm, I'm doing pretty good with mine. And you can see that my site ranks really high when you search for voice lessons. So in other words, we were kind of competitors, but he took pity on me. And he was like, you know what I did? was I just took this online SEO course and it's how I hit number one on Google in like 30 days, I think was the title of it. <laughs> and it's like the most clickbaity title. Very clear title. of the promise there in that yes. course. <laughs> very, yeah. very clickbaity, but it, it worked. And so I started doing this course and I actually posted a, a comment in the learning dashboard and said, hey, you know, what would you do if this was a situation? And the author of the course actually responded to me. And just on a lark, I was like, well, hey, I don't know if, if you're in Austin, Texas, but if you ever are, I'd love to give you some voice lessons if you can kind of help me out with this stuff. It just so happened that he was in Austin and he was interested in singing. And so he actually started to, he never once paid for a lesson. He just came in one day and for the next two and a half years, I basically sweat blood while he worked on the back end of my site and I was busy creating content for the front end. I got real lucky. I want to encourage people listening, trading your services for the services of somebody else that you need to grow your business is I think one of the most rewarding things you can do as an entrepreneur. I've done it so many times. I had, when I first got into photography, I traded a, a camera for business coaching and man, you like, got the camera in this instance. I got the camera. Yeah, provided yeah. Business coaching. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was such a great move. And it's so, it's so interesting to be able to trade for stuff. I, that's what I do with my, my personal trainer. Yeah. I do business coaching with him. He does personal training with me. Exactly. It's awesome. And it's, it's a fun relationship when there is a non-monetary exchange going on there. Yes. Yeah. I think that there's like a, a genuine goodwill that kind of yeah. happens on both sides. Like, I mean, I, t I mean, typically I teach half hour, one hour lessons. I think that guy was getting like two hour lessons every week. And it was just like, you know, I was so grateful to him. And I think that he was grateful to me for the help there. But one thing that, that you said that I think is really interesting is that in the beginning, when you're first getting started off, you really don't have that many bargaining chips, you know, and mm. you don't you don't have the the income necessarily to be like, OK, so I'm going to pay the six thousand dollars or whatever it is in order to, to get training with this person. So there's kind of an interesting shift that happens, you know, however, X, X number of years down the road where you're finally making an income and you're like. I'll just pay the darn money. Like, I'll just pay it. It's yeah. like, I, I need the help. 
these guys are the people to do it. I'm actually going through that uh, right now. I'm finishing up one coaching program that was exorbitantly expensive from my perspective, but it was a, a huge transformation in my own business. But could I have gotten there without the help that I received for free and teaching for free for a couple of years? No. Yeah, so there's a, there's a fine line between when to wait around and try to get free slash traded services with someone versus just paying the damn money and getting the results sooner. There is a, there is a balance there that I'm glad you kind of mentioned, Matt, yep. just because like it can be awesome to trade for services, but if you're on the receiving end of the inferior service, that can be a bit of a, of a, oh, of yeah. a pain. <laughs> oh yeah. And, but you know, in your, in your instance where you got free SEO services that essentially in your own words, changed the trajectory of your business, totally worth it to do two hour lessons a week for somebody for, a, for that long of a time, because it essentially made your business. Totally. So I would like to shift a little bit to the content marketing side of things. Cause you, you mentioned, I, I'm surprised. I was surprised by the SEO thing took me off guard. I love that. That's, that was a huge part of the transition to full time, but I, I can't help, but at least see the, the fruit of the, the content marketing side of things. So when did you start to shift towards content marketing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the SEO thing is really good for your location. And I think that if you're just getting started off, that's a great place to get started and make sure that you're getting local business. But when you're trying to reach people outside of your immediate area, or maybe you have maybe a digital product or a digital service or a digital you know, coaching that you do, then getting outside of your immediate area is absolutely crucial. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that I'd been doing that work for five years before COVID, because once that hit... I was still getting students from way outside of Austin, people in China and people in Australia and people all over the world that had found my stuff via content marketing. So to answer your question, I started doing, I started writing blogs, the most thorough, helpful, and hopefully interesting blogs that I could possibly do about five years ago. And I probably did that for about two and a half straight years. Mm. I was just writing. I was doing YouTube stuff at that time as well, um, but the blog was really, really my 100% focus. Yeah, so I, I do want to clarify two things really quick because I, 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 I have the curse of knowledge where I forget that people don't know everything in the world. SEO stands for search engine optimization. That's when someone Googles your business name and they find you as the first search result. That's what we talk about when we're saying SEO. And content marketing, for anyone who's not familiar, is just when you're creating content that's valuable to people, like Matt just said there, and then they're reading it, getting familiar with you, learning about your business, diving deeper with you, it starts the relationship and nurtures them versus just selling to them nonstop. So that's what we're talking about here in the content yeah. marketing conversation. So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone who might be confused or not familiar with the, with the phrasing here. But you were creating blog articles. You said you did this for how many? You said five years, something like that? You did uh, it for- I started about five years ago and I wrote for about two and a half straight years. Great. How often were you posting uh, blog articles at that, during that two year time frame? So that's the interesting thing. It, Google does not care how often you're posting. They care that you're posting the best possible stuff that is the most helpful to people, that is keeping people on your site. To answer your question, I was probably releasing like a 5,000 word post around a high traffic keyword probably once every two weeks. I was going pretty crazy with it. I mean, that, that's a long article for anyone who's not familiar with it. Like my longest article is probably around five or 6,000 words and they generally will be around 2,000 words. And I haven't put a blog article out in forever because I hate writing. But I, I do want to ask one thing there. You mentioned uh, around high volume keyword. How do you know what's a keyword worth writing a topic about? And how do you spread that around the article in a way that makes sense for Google to like? Oh man, we could talk about this for, for hours. But there's, there's so many creative ways, Brian. So the simple answer is you could use a tool like Google Keyword Analyzer that's created by Google for the people that are planning on running ads. So in order to sign up for that, you actually do need a credit card. But if you don't actually start running ads, they don't charge you anything. And you can use their keyword research tool for free. So you put in your credit card number, you have this little Google account, and then you can start looking for different ideas. You know, for me, singing lessons, uh, singing lessons, Austin, voice lessons, vocal coach, voice teacher, singing, all this stuff. You plug all of those in and then it'll actually start suggesting different terms that you can. And right there in a beautiful little spreadsheet, It'll say, okay, so this is, you know, you can expect 10,000 people a month to search for this. Vibrato, for instance, is something that lots of singers want to learn about. Vibrato is a high traffic keyword. I'm going to make this up, but I think it had like 5,000 to 10,000 monthly searches. Mm -hmm. And I just plugged that into Google Keyword uh, Research Tool and it just popped that out. And it'll even tell you what the competition is like 
for that keyword. Although I wouldn't recommend really trusting that rating because I fought like hell to to get some of those blogs ranked highly. So don't necessarily take that as as gospel, but that's a great tool. So let's talk about actually now interweaving those keywords. Like let's just use the vibrato thing that you talked about. What are you doing? Like what are some just bullet points on things that you're doing to, to interweave that in through the article so that it is readable, helpful, and like and is liked by Google? Yeah. Well, Google's really smart and 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 she knows I call her a she. I don't know why. But <laughs> I, like I, that. that's great. I feel like it's a goddess that we all, all the smartest ones are. They're yeah, all right. Women. Exactly. I think that that's safe, right? It's pretty woke. So in my experience, Google's really smart. And when you actually are trying to rank for a term, like you're like, oh, everyone wants to sing with vibrato. Vibrato is one of those helpful da 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 vibrato. If you put that in too many times, they'll actually penalize you. So you want to make sure that you're... That's called keyword stuffing or is that, exactly. is that keyword stuffing a different thing? Yeah. No, that's keyword stuffing. There was also a more extreme version of this in earlier internet days when you would literally have like a white HTML page and somebody would put in like vibrato, vibrato, all in white text. So you couldn't so you actually see it. see it, but Google would read it and be like, oh, this is about vibrato. Let's shoot that up to the top. Anyway, that's a bunch of clowns did that. Black hat SEO. That's yeah. it right there. That's it. And there's there's far more black hat stuff. I mean, I've heard about this guy that like he runs like individual servers that are all like he has servers in his house that are all like pointing back to his website and like keeping crawlers on his website like 24 seven. So it always wow. ranks it highly. That's too nerdy for creatives like me. man. It's I can't. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Now, I'm not going to say it was easy. It definitely wasn't. It took a lot of work. But all I could say to answer your question is just write the most helpful, natural article that you possibly can around this given subject matter. Make sure that it's the best. Look at the other ones that are ranking highly for it and make sure that yours is better. Make sure that yours is more helpful. And it doesn't have to be longer. It just has to keep people engaged and on the page for longer. Do you trust any tools that give you like SEO scores? Tools like, uh, what's the, the big one on WordPress? I have it. Oh, S- SEM Rush. Yep. SEM Rush is a big one. And there's one other one that has a weirder name, but I can't remember it. Yoast or something like that. Yoast. Yeah. I, I trust Yoast. Yoast does a pretty good job. And it'll even tell you if like you have, they call it keyword density. Like if you have too many keywords within a given, you know, space of time, it'll be like, your keyword density is 2.3%. We only recommend a 0.5%. So you can, it might even help you sometimes to take out a few vibratos. Vibrato is one of those weird words because you can't actually talk about it without saying the word. So like I probably have a bad Yoast score on that one. But for other things, it's tough like, to be pitch perfect on, on vibrato. Yeah, it is. It is definitely. Ryan, comment. Just shake, he's shaking his head, everybody. Keep All going, right. Chris. What else you got? I like, the, I like the dead silence. The worst part about this, it, I, I, I've said this a million times on the podcast before, but the look Chris has on his face as he's trying to interrupt the guest to fit his stupid pun in <laughs> and then finding a gap in Matt's wonderful education to, f- to just force the pun in. And then the look on Matt's face of trying to be polite uh, is priceless. <laughs> he's working on his, on his tight five. Well, you know? I, there you go. I did have a question related to this. So I I wanted to build up to this. Matt, I'm wondering, so from my perspective. Matt's now laughing at you because he can't. I'm already bracing. Are you going to throw another pun in or is this a real question? I I feel my my back getting tight, just worried. (laughs) I'm like, oh God, what's he going to say now? Oh my God. Well, no, I I have a really nice compliment slash wristy. I'm going to call you wristy. I won't take any wrists on this next comment. Do you get it out of your system? No. Um, okay. But I'll keep going anyways. So Matt, here's my question for you. From my perspective, and I think Brian's going to agree with me wholeheartedly here, you know all the things and I'm wondering how much more valuable that skill is than, than what you're actually selling as a, as a coach. Oh, wow. That's such a good question. So to be honest with you, I have at different times been... So I think what you're alluding to is like, why don't I just like become like a, a digital marketer or something yeah, like, like or, me or, or start going into that <laughs> niche. And, yeah. But to be totally honest, and I really do, I admire the people that know what they're talking about in that niche, but it's so darn competitive that it's like, actually vocal coaching is very competitive too. There's a lot mm. of really, really great channels and good, good blogs out there. But I kind of wanted to just really plant my flag in the whole singing thing and really feel like that's, really wrapped up and you know I've got my courses and I've got you know my apps and all yeah. this you know my ebooks and all that stuff 
So I really wanted to feel like that was going to wrap up before I, I transitioned to something that was like a little more uh, B2B, like business to business. But I think it's invaluable to know this no matter what profession you're doing. Totally agreed. And that's really the point of, of our podcast is to teach these things that people can, can use to grow their smaller businesses. But I think what gets interesting, and we've seen this with many of our listeners, is they develop these business skills. Brian and I did that. We developed our business skills and then realized that our business skills were more valuable than our business. Right. And it was like, oh, crap. That's so cool, but also not what I wanted to do. Well, you just do like me and just run a million businesses at the same time, which yeah. also has its own flaws. <laughs> That's same. So I want to get us back on track here with <laughs> the SEO discussion and the content marketing discussion here. Yeah, we because, haven't even uh, talked about YouTube yet. That's a whole other ball of wax. I'm working my way up to it, Matt, but you have too much damn good content to share along the way. So this is going to run like a longer episode. My Aww, bad. Thanks, guys. So I, I, before we actually get to the YouTube side of things, I just want to point out uh, one important thing, how, how much SEO is tied into your content marketing strategy, at least with the blog articles. I'm assuming the same thing with YouTube. Mm. We'll get to that. But SEO, search engine optimization, and content marketing go hand in hand with each other. So when you're creating content, if you can, it is helpful to keep it around specific keywords and topics so that you're not just getting that initial burst of traffic when you release, release a new po uh, piece of content. You're getting what they call the long tail, the traffic from Google over the long period of time of people finding your website through searching for certain things that they're trying to learn about or trying to look up and finding your website. And then ultimately, hopefully hiring Matt for his vocal, vocal coaching services. So can you talk about some of the, some of the results you found as you built your, your uh, blog catalog through the years, what that led to? Yeah, listen, I mean, anytime that you can connect with people on a human level and, and try to help them before they even give you a dollar, you're usually in a really good place. Blogs, certainly, but YouTube as well. And maybe we can segue into this, but it's like, think about how valuable it is. Like if you're like searching for like, you know, a new tire, you need a new tire or something like that. And you, you try to fix it yourself and you're like doing terribly and you can't even take the, the wheel off. And so you just YouTube a video and then you're like, oh, how to change a tire. And so you find the video helpful. And then you just see that it happens to be at like a shop around you or a national chain or something like that. How much more likely are you to go to that chain versus some other generic chain that's never helped you in the least? No, you trust that you trust that original brand that helped you out when you weren't when they then they didn't ask for anything. And so in terms of results, certainly from the SEO stuff and a search engine viewpoint, it absolutely revolutionized how many singers I was getting each week to my studio. And on top of that, it also absolutely made a huge difference in how many people all over the world were finding my website and could potentially one day book a lesson with me. Because now, you know, everything's online and I'm teaching online. And, you know, I could tomorrow, if I decided to, just say, I don't want to teach in person lessons anymore. I'm just going to do everything virtually and I'm going to live in Wyoming. It'd be fine. But big love to Wyoming, by the way. Beautiful state, beautiful state. You know, John not, Mayer lives there. Does he really? See, I didn't even know that. I don't think we needed to know that, Chris. Well, <laughs> well thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. No problem. And value. <laughs> but you could, you could do that. And having that flexibility as an entrepreneur is like absolutely priceless. I mean, I love living in Austin, Texas, and it happens to be a music city, which all plays in my favor as well. But it's so cool to be able to have a product or service that is finding people all over the world, regardless of where you are. But the first step is getting your local people first. So you were putting blog articles out consistently for a couple of years. Yeah. You were ranking for certain high traffic keywords, which is driving traffic to your website. At that time, were you smart enough to have some sort of lead magnet or something to, to build a mailing list yet? Or had, did you not start doing that until you had a YouTube channel? Where did the <laughs> mailing list come into play? I actually had a lead magnet and all of the pop-ups and all that stuff before I actually started getting more traffic. And I, I don't know whether that was the right answer or not, because no, it was I had always like, the right answer. I had like 30 people on my site a month and I was like, you know, shoving my offers in their face and nobody wanted it yet. If you I'll tell you right now, it is much better to be that person who has who's who's willing to promote what they have and put it in their face before you have the audience than it is for someone who has the massive audience and is too timid to put it out there. Absolutely. And so they those are the people that have the smaller, the tiny businesses, right. even though the people that have the smaller traffic flow and the bigger, they're more willing to push their own, you know, basically sell themselves. They typically always have the bigger business. So at, at what point well, did you start to see the email list grow? 
No, Chris, you had something. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So what Brian, what Brian said there about putting yourself out there with your business, there's a caveat there. I run into this all the time with people that are like, oh, I don't want, I want my business to grow, but I don't want to tell anyone about my business. Mm, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, yeah, you can put yourself out there and talk about yourself and be a self promoter and all that stuff. But what you can do as well is you can create value that is a lead magnet. And I think this is a great place to segue back to your website. You have a vocal coaching website. And when you go on the vocal coaching website, ramseyvoice.com, at the very top of that, there's a question that says, it's very insulting. And we could talk about this too, but it's like, do you want to, do you want to find your vocal range and stop sounding like an idiot? Now, I tested that headline with like five other very much, much nicer variations. And the idiot one just really converted way better. Yeah, just for anyone who's not familiar with what he's talking about. So on his website, he has a, a awesome tool that you can sing into it, your lowest note and your highest note. And it tells you what range you should be in. And like, it helps you kind of pick your range. So you're not singing in a range that makes you sound stupid. And so in the copy of the lead magnet, he's in, in, in the smart thing is he asks for your email before it gives you the results. So he's building an email list. Like how many people did you say you got on your email list from this one lead magnet, by the way, in the, in the last couple of years, probably about 25,000. That's in, that. See, that is insane to me. So you have this one lead magnet bringing 25,000 people and the headline of it says something to the effect of, do you want to know your vocal range and stop sounding like an idiot or so you don't sound like an idiot? These sorts of things, like most people will never even test, but these polarizing sort of headlines are the ones that actually work really well. And you split tested this, which means you've tested yeah. it against a nice kind, get your vocal range now, like super generic copy and this one beat it out. I tested that against what I would even consider like really interesting value proposition kind of statements. Like, do you want to find your vocal range so you can find the right song for your voice? Or do you want like, do you want to find what your voice type is like bass, baritone, tenor or something like that? And the, the idiot one just really, it just smoked everything else. And, you know, not, not trying to be disrespectful of anyone out there because I think that singing is a very vulnerable thing in the first place, but you also have to, what's that phrase? You have to sell people what they want and give them what they need. Bingo. And nobody right. wants to sound like an idiot. Exactly. That's universal truth. So hitting on that pain point was, was important to get people to, to actually, you know, engage with it and stuff. And if you want to test it out on your own, by the way, it's just rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com. It's just a, a simple app that I paid a couple hundred dollars to have it designed. You sing your lowest notes, you enable your mic, you sing your highest note, you enable your mic, and then it'll be like calculating and then t tells you to put in your email address and you can even share it socially. So I wanted to build in some, some virality that way too, is like, I wanted to, I envisioned like, you know, kids or young adults, you know, testing out the range and sharing it on Facebook and be like, oh, you test out your range. I don't have enough analytics to know whether that actually happens, but I believe that it probably does based on the results that I've gotten from it. Let's talk about, there's so many different reasons that what you did is genius. So the idiot thing appeals to a really base part of our psychology where we don't want to look stupid. Because if we look stupid, we'll get kicked out of the tribe and we might not be able to find a mate. There's old, old stuff that, you know, even rodents have that psychology going on. So that's really, really powerful. The other thing is that find your range is a competitive topic for singers. Yeah, we literally yeah. just naturally, Chris and I competed the second yeah. we found it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, and we should have recorded it. It was hilarious. Yeah. But, you know, we both live on our call, like sang our highest and lowest note and wanted to see who had the wider range. And so and that I destroyed you by an entire octave. Yeah. as well who's the real winner here because because the vocal coach oh, you would are ask, you got both of our email addresses yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were smart i even try to fake <laughs> i even try to fake email address and it's like nope not that one yeah. so <laughs> yeah brilliant well, so you've got you're appealing to people so that they look good socially right you're appealing to people's ego they can use this tool to gauge where they're at which you know gives you some sort of inherent excitement about that it's right on the website. You let them do play with this fun toy. And then you ask for the email address. Yeah. Which I'm sure that you are like your click through rate. The number of people that actually put their email address in after using your tool is probably 90%, 95%, something obnoxiously high. And then I would bet it's not, but I'd bet it's much higher than most people who do a similar yeah, kind of thing. Much higher than most people. Yeah. If you consider that opt-in rates across the board are like at one or 2%, I mean, yeah. anything higher than that is pretty yeah. good. 
I'm going to actually pause there for a second because I want to actually kind of bring our audience along on this journey. I haven't done this yet, this interview. Usually I do a better job of this sort of stuff, but I just want to kind of sum up what Matt's strategy has been thus far in the interview so far, because as creatives, we do not run our businesses this way. This is the way, this is the way, you know, online course people and bloggers, and this is the way, you know, all the gurus online kind of run their business not us creatives, not photographers, not videographers, not graphic designers, not audio engineers, not producers. We don't do it that way, but you can. I see people who do it that way. What you said exactly, Brian, is is so true in that. And one thing that you said in your your last podcast before you guys have made the switch over to the Six Figure Creative Podcast is that some of the most creative people that you know are not other music people necessarily. Sometimes they're graphic designers and sometimes they're, you know, uh, you know massage therapists, whatever it is. But we actually, I think, and I can just speak for myself here and you guys can chime in, but I've actually learned so much more from marketing people in terms of like, this is the way to run a business. And I think that there's this part of us inside that's like, ooh, I don't want to do, you know, this is my art and I don't want to like do all these seemingly shady tactics. They're not, there's nothing shady about making money from your passion or making money from your creativity. As long as you're not like, you know, filling lots of false promises and stuff like that and doing anything like outwardly scammy, which I think that all of us know what that looks like and all of us will will avoid. But there are so many people that are just afraid to even put together, you know, like a free course to add on their site or something like that. That's something that, you know, those digital marketer guys that I always skip their Facebook ads do. There's a reason that those guys do those ads. There's a reason that those guys have those free courses uh, because they work. So Matt's strategy so far, just kind of sum it up so that I'm hoping all creatives can kind of follow along with this. Matt has a service that he offers, which is vocal coaching, no different than pretty much any other creative service. You are helping someone through a transformation. If it's a, if you're a music producer, you're helping someone take a song idea and turn it to a full production. If you're a photographer, you're taking someone's look and making them look awesome. You're making your people look awesome. If you're a, if you're a designer, you're going someone with just an idea and helping them actually flesh it out on paper. So you have a transformational outcome you're giving your client, which is what Matt is doing. And then he is like, okay, I have this thing that I'm good at that I love to do. How am I going to actually get people to find me? How am I going to fill the top of the, the funnel as we like to call it on here with your marketing funnels? And so he's, he invests in SEO by giving free services to somebody, someone that, who can help him show up on Google on the top results. And then he also invests time, effort, and energy writing blog articles that are high quality, 5,000 word posts that have, he's done the work in putting research into the keywords so that you're actually writing stuff that's going to be found. It's long and, and interesting and helpful, which is the most important thing because these blog articles are mini services. You're helping someone with a transformational outcome on every single article that they read that Matt puts out. So he's genuinely helping somebody on these articles, which is building something called the reciprocity effect. The reciprocity effect is when you do something for me, I inherently want to do something for you that could be hiring you. So if some people, these people are hiring Matt, some are just joining his mailing list and following along the journey and eventually maybe hiring him. I, I would, I would bet a thousand dollars right now that there's somebody on Matt's mailing list that has recently hired him or bought something from him that joined years ago and didn't pay a dime until recently. Like that is the stuff that happens when you build a mailing list. And so all along the way, he is smartly building his mailing list. And I don't know what he's doing with the mailing list yet. Maybe we'll get to it. Maybe we won't, but he's using that mailing list to build his business further. So he has SEO. He has helpful blog articles that are building uh, the relationship with with the uh, potential clients. He has a mailing list that is capturing the leads long-term so he can market them long-term. And he has a transformational outcome that he's providing. And these things alone are enough to build a significant business. And from what I know, it's over six figures. We don't have to get into the specifics of the income, but it's a significant income. And you're doing things in a way that most service professionals, most coaches, most people are not doing And I just want to make sure that we're highlighting this because this can be replicated by pretty much any creative field, any creative service. Yeah. What you're doing, Matt, that I think is so important for creatives that have some hesitancy to market themselves. We need some snappy word to refer to that fear. But what you're doing is you're, you're marketing that you'll help people for free. Right. And then after you've helped them for free, you offer to help them more for money. Right. That's the business model, right? Am I right? Exactly. Amazing. So any creative has their, their ideal customer has problems that need to be solved. And you can solve some of those problems for free 
and you can help them even further through paid services. But there is, it's essentially a baby step from stranger to customer. And that's what Matt has done really well. So if we have time, we're past the time a lot that we had here, but you know, like if you're willing to go a little further and go into the YouTube side of things, I would love to, to get a feel for when YouTube came into this. And if this replaced your entire blog strategy, cause you said you, mm. you did blogs for a couple of years. Now you seem to be big on YouTube and doing that a lot. Where did YouTube come into the picture here? Well, I actually had a student who was like, you know, you're you're really good at this. It would be awesome for you to actually like start a channel so that people can actually see, you know, what it would be like to, you know, learn from you and they can practice along and stuff like that. And I really, really appreciated uh, that insight because up until then I was kind of like, oh, you know, you just have to come in person. Well, if again, if any if there's any way for people to connect with you on a personal level before they spend a single dollar with you, there's so much more likely to become a loyal mm. customer. And so even in those early days, I mean, I had a terrible camera. I had terrible sound. I was actually operating under a different business name. My original voice teacher was Octave Hire, and he was like, hey, you can use the name Octave Hire East. Two years later, he changed his mind. So all of a sudden, I had like 50 videos that like all said Octave Hire East rather than Ramsey Voice Studio. Lesson learned on that, creatives. Make sure that you're good with the name that you have uh, if you're going to spend so much effort into branding into it. That's a story for another time. But yeah, so I had all of these videos and I was actually putting out a video a week. Well, here's the problem with that. YouTube doesn't care how often you're posting. Google doesn't care how often you're posting. They care about... Sorry, let me walk that back for just a second. They care that you're posting somewhat consistently. You can't just post once a year. But don't feel like in a YouTube kind of viewpoint that you have to post something every single day. It's way more, way more important to shoot something really high quality that people watch for long periods of time to make sure that you're actually going to rank for stuff appropriately. It was kind of interesting what you said earlier was like, well, I'm sure the keyword stuff from that you learned from SEO applies completely to YouTube as well. That's what I thought. But YouTube doesn't care about keywords. They care about the video quality and that people are watching it, that people are engaged for the entire amount of the video. And that That's was so what you call a knowledge bomb right there. You're, that blew my mind. I'll tell you, I was chasing that dragon for like a couple of years. I was like, well, I put together this video on vibrato and, you know, how to hit high notes and, you know, belting and all these high traffic keywords that worked really well for my blog. Right. Again, YouTube doesn't care. The key metric on YouTube is watch time. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. hundred yeah. percent. So just to give you an example, I did a little sprint where I shot like 10 videos around high traffic keywords because I was still thinking from SEO land. I was like, this is what I need to do. I need to rank for how to sing. I need to rank for how to hit high notes. I need to rank for vibrato, for, you know, belting, whatever it happens to be. And I did. I did rank for those things. But the amount of people that are actually searching for those terms on YouTube is really, really small compared to the number of videos that YouTube just shows to people that they think might be interested in something. So here's the counterexample to that. Amongst that sprint of 10 videos, I shot one called How to Find Your Natural Voice. And at the time, I was like, no one's going to watch this. No one's searching on YouTube how to find my voice. There's certainly people that do. But I was like, there's not going to be as many people of those that search how to sing. Well, now that video has a million views. And my How to Sing video only has like 40,000 or something like that. Because YouTube saw and it started recommending that video to people that were searching and interested in singing. And they started clicking on that video and they watched the whole darn thing. And all of a sudden, YouTube's like, okay, that's the one. It's going straight to the top. So the search term doesn't really matter. Did I explain that clearly enough? I'm lurking your YouTube, which is why I'm not talking. I'm looking at all the stuff that you're talking about right now. And one thing that does stand out to me when I look at this video, it's your second most viewed video. Your first being called 10 Singing Techniques to Improve Your Voice. Both of these thumbnails have the same look, same vibe, but they stand out. So where does the thumbnail come into play when it comes to actually getting viewed on YouTube? Yeah, so the, the thumbnail is, is the gateway. If people don't click on it, and it's, then it's not going to get viewed. And so you can't get those metrics that I'm talking about, about watch time, if nobody's actually clicking on it. So a thumbnail and headline are absolutely crucial just to get people watching the darn thing. And then actually, once they're watching it, making sure that they're, they're watching through the whole thing and you're kind of keeping things interesting, you're using lots of interesting cuts. It sounds like I'm rambling, 
That's because it's a mystery even to the people that are experts at YouTube. They use this AI that like predicts like what's going to be a successful thing and no one could actually say this is the thing. All you can just speak in is generalities and say that, yeah, you want to have a high watch time. You want to have a high click through rate on your thumbnail, et cetera. So with that, YouTube gives you pretty good analytics, though, to give you an idea yeah. of where your new viewers and subscribers are coming from. Is that correct? Do you have a pretty good grasp on the gist of like, are they coming from search search results? Are they coming from recommended videos? Are they, where is your viewership coming from for the most part? Yeah, that was kind of my point from earlier is like search is like the bottom. Like nobody, nobody really cares about search. Like there's just not that many people that are are doing it. So if you just try an experiment, this is something that your listeners can do too. If you just go to youtube.com and let's say that you hadn't, you had a specific thing that you wanted to search for. By the time you actually go to the homepage on youtube.com, you've totally forgotten about what that thing that you were going to search for was. And by then you've clicked on one of the things that YouTube gave you on your homepage. Mm. That's what you really want. You really All want the time. I even have a plugin on my computer that blocks those videos. Oh, that's so, so I don't smart. Get distracted. Yeah. yeah. So like you, you actually really the golden the the holy grail is hitting that recommended videos. So if you actually looked at the analytics for that find your voice video, I would say like maybe ten or fifteen percent of the people that find that are just searching for it, which is there's nothing to sneeze at there. It's still a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand views. So it's it's not it's no small amount for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of a million for sure. But really quickly, once you have a video that starts to hit, you'll see that proportion shift. At, at first, it'll be like mm. people are seeing it because they're subscribed to you, and then you'll actually start in maybe some search, and then you'll see it start to go to suggested. And once it hits suggested, like 80% of people are you finding, finding you through suggested, you've got to hit pretty much. So you, and I've only hit that like two or three times out of 200 videos. So just to show you my track record. <laughs> well, that's what actually leads to the next point that I think is probably where we'll kind of wrap this conversation up just for the sake of time is... is Consistency. You, so you said something that uh, caught my ear and I think you, you meant it but didn't mean it was YouTube doesn't care how often you post, but they do care that you are consistent in some way, shape or form, or at the very least, people care that you're consistent because the more consistent you are, the better you are. I want to talk about mm. content. How do you actually plan out content so that you always have fresh ideas? You're never running out. You don't have to scramble week to week, or maybe you are scrambling week to week. I don't know. I don't know you very well. <laughs> what's, your, what's your strategy around planning content? Wow, there is a plan and sometimes there isn't a plan. So I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I can plan to shoot like 10 videos around these high traffic keywords that I think are going to do well. And maybe only one of them does well. And maybe it's not the one that I thought was going to do well. And so what I've actually kind of pivoted towards is doing videos that I think people will find interesting. Rather than trying to write a video or write a script for the bots, like I'm kind of doing with Google, let's be honest, on YouTube, I'm trying to make it interesting, as interesting as possible for the people um, that are actually interested in singing. Maybe they're not even subscribers of my channel, but I want to make it so that as soon as they see that thumbnail or what have you, uh, that they click on it. I think the way you could explain that is to say that Google's search algorithm is predictive. They're looking at signals to decide whether, you know, it's primarily predictive. I think YouTube's algorithm is primarily reactive. They want to see how human beings will react to the video and they can very e easily see like, well, did they click on it and then finish the video? What percentage of people that clicked on the video finish the video what percentage of people click on the video? These are really simple metrics to give YouTube a loud and clear signal that, oh my gosh, we showed this thumbnail to 100 people, 100 people clicked it, and 100 people finished it. Here's the way that you can really generalize about it. Google wants to give you an answer as soon as possible. YouTube wants to keep you watching videos for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's so true. It never wants you to leave. Wow. Once you get trapped, yes. they want you to stay in there, which is why we can go down YouTube rabbit holes for five or six hours. And I make this comparison with singing coaches all the time is like, you know, people will just search one thing related to singing. Before they know it, they've watched 10 videos, 10 different teachers. They're so confused, which is why it's such a great idea to get personal feedback from a real vocal coach. Uh, something that I sell through my, my programs and my own personal coaching, of course. But Google is actually trying to, trying to help you, trying to get you some real answers right now, because that's what you need. You need to, you've got the nail in the tire. Okay, let's get you to a tire shop. If I like, start searching nail and tire on YouTube, Pretty soon, I'm going to be watching, uh, what is it? Uh, Chris I, Fix. 
That's the yes. YouTube channel that you're going to find that's the most Chris, popular for that topic. Is that your own YouTube channel, Chris? No, it's not. It's a, a oh. different guy, but he's fantastic. And he taught me how to fix my Jeep before I broke my Jeep. He's without a doubt the number one guy for automotive. Look at that. See? Boom. There you are. And, and you're, three, you're three videos in and you're just like an hour's gone by. You're sweating in the car. You still got the nail in the tire and you're like, how am I going to get home? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow I'm now watching Everest videos of somebody summoning Everest and I want to climb a mountain. I don't know why I don't even do this. That's that. It feels like a, when I'm on Facebook, it's like when you have millions or billions of dollars of, of venture capitalist funds sunk into a piece of software whose job is to keep you on the platform as long as possible, you will wake up an hour later, not realizing what just happened. You're just an hour later in the day. You haven't been productive at all, which is why I have that plugin that blocks Google recommended videos on What's YouTube. What's the documentary about this? They got so popular, The Social Dilemma. The Social Dilemma, yeah. If you but, guys haven't watched that on Netflix, it's worth your time. But just to bring it back to your, to your listeners for a second, like I know all this sounds really like kind of high level and it's like, oh, how, how am I supposed to do that? You know, what's, what would be interesting for my audience? And like, how do I get my titles and thumbnails and stuff like that? If you're just getting started off, just start off by trying to be helpful. Just try to shoot really as good of production as you can, high production quality videos that are just helping people solve their problems. So if you're a graphic designer, then maybe you can do some screen grabs of how you, you know, eliminate red eye. I'm making this up as I go. But, you know, just try to answer these simple questions first. You'll naturally start to grow some subscribers and a following to your channel because again you're being helpful and you're trying to give people the best answers possible and then naturally over time you're going to start to see what kind of content is successful and that's what you can start writing whereas with google and writing for google it's like you already have a pretty good idea about what's going to work before you do it and so you're kind of writing for google versus with youtube just start off trying to be helpful and i think that goes across the board yeah, I think I think any creative can understand that. Like you may have a you may be allergic to marketing. You may not want to sell like sell yourself online and feel icky about it because you're trying to charge money for something you love to do. But you can resonate with helping people because I feel like most creatives they want to help people. That's that's part of the reason why they're doing what they're doing. So that makes total sense when it comes to actually creating content for YouTube. Just just be helpful. Just try to help somebody. If you can help somebody, that's 90% of it. Well, and Brian, I think that you accidentally stumbled across the word I was looking for earlier. You talked about marketing in regards to allergy. I think us referring to this hesitation of creatives to market themselves as being allergic to marketing. It's a marketing allergy. Yep. I use that all the time. And I love that phrasing because it's, it's, it sums up an element that a lot of creatives have. And so I'm hoping that interviews like this, people will start to have an inoculation against marketing. Well, but not <laughs> Something. to help them change their definition. Say marketing isn't, isn't pitching yourself. Marketing is helping people. And then That's you don't true. have to pitch yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, 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 literally, Brian and I are doing this right now to you. I was, I was about to say, what do you think this podcast episode yeah. is? This is a form of content marketing. Yeah. And we're hoping that we've genuinely helped people. So Matt, I think a good place to end here would just to kind of be tell people, where can they go if they want to find out more about you or take your vocal thing or just where do you want to send our audience for, for your services or for what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think a good place to start is just going to my homepage at ramseyvoice.com. That's R-A-M-S-E-Y voice spelled the normal way. Right there, there's a, a place to put in your email address and get a 10 free singing techniques to improve your voice get sent right to your to your inbox. No, you forgot to, to improve your voice so you don't sound like an idiot. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we experimented with that language and then that language was different. So yeah, so, so many different things we could talk about. Yeah, this, this could go for, for eight hours, but that's a great place to get started. But if you're uh, competitive, if you're the competitive sort and you think that you've got a good range or a range that's at least bigger than your closest friends, then you can go to rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com and you just put in your email and it tells you what range you've got. And you can even measure it over time and see if it gets better as you do vocal training. And just to tell people right now, the, the thing to beat is four octaves. I'm pulling up my screenshot here. From F2 to A6. Nice. That's my vocal range. Nice. Yikes. So that is it for this interview of the Six Figure Creative Podcast. Chris, what did you think, my dude? Were you as surprised as I was? I was. Matt is the total package. He, there was yeah. so much stuff where I was like, he started to talk about like the keyword finder and Google AdWords and all this like yeah. really nuancey stuff. And I, it was amazing to be like, whoa, he did the work. He knows yeah. about all this random stuff. He must be as like traumatized as I am to have 
<laughs> Not everyone uses knowledge, learning, and systems as a coping mechanism. That's true. <laughs> I, think Matt, I think Matt was just trying to build a, a good long-term sustainable business. Well, so like he, we came on, we got him on the podcast because I was like, oh, he's got a large YouTube presence. And I think content marketing is an important strategy as we move forward as creatives, just because it is a way to add value. And with so many creatives is allergic to marketing, kind of like we talked about earlier. I think content marketing is a really good, I guess, I don't know what we are going to call that, but it's a really good thing to combat allergy because all you're doing is helping people. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to bring him on for that. And what we got out of him was completely unexpected because we didn't even get to the YouTube stuff to the very end here. So we, we had so much that he, he brought to the table with SEO and with trading services. And I just think that it was cool to hear his creative journey and how unique it was compared to, you know, Alex Vasulu that we had on the podcast, you know, a few episodes back where she was actually doing this through all through Fiverr. Like her journey was completely different, but similar results as far as monetary income and success, like completely different paths, but a similar result. I just love that that that's an option. Yeah. It's like, not only do some of the things that we do as creatives not exist 10 years ago as a career option, but the, the paths to success are as various as the options we have to do as for money. Like I, I worded that ter terribly, but you know what I'm trying to say? Like yeah. our paths are endless. And so hearing his path to success is so cool to hear. Well, and that's such a great proof for us that our concept for this podcast is so valid that if you have a creative business and you're offering a service and you want to grow your business, you need to learn from creatives outside of your niche. The whole interview I'm thinking through. So I have this like, I have this weird thing I do when I'm listening to guests. I always try to put myself in the shoe of the guest listening to the podcast, which is why I kind of went back eventually and described what SEO meant and what content marketing meant. Yeah, that was amazing. Because I want to make sure like people are following along. And if someone says something that doesn't make sense for me as the listener's viewpoint, I want to try to either dig in more or point that out or try to, or try to translate it into something that makes sense. But everything that he said makes sense from my perspective as you know, audio engineer, from the perspective of other avatars that I have in my head as I'm listening, creatives that are in like other fields like photography, videography, graphic design, freelance writing. A lot of what Matt does is one-to-one -one applicable. You're just, all you're doing is writing about different kinds of content, creating different kinds of content on YouTube, and you would have different lead magnets essentially is what he's doing on your website. That's literally it. You, you just change some of the things out, but the template really matches for any creative service. Well, and what makes this conversation with Matt so relevant is that in your creative niche, you know, let's say you're photographing babies, like you're a baby portrait photographer. There might not be anyone like Matt who's doing such a great job at content marketing. There's no one yeah. to look at and say, okay, well, I want to be like them. It's so much more powerful to be, I want to be like the Matt of baby photography. Yeah. So he mentioned about how, how competitive it is in the general like marketing space. Like in the grand scheme of things, I don't think Matt would argue with me. He wouldn't be a big fish in the overall like marketing pond if he were to go head to head yeah. against the best marketers. But in the vocal coaching world, he could stand toe to toe with some of the top people Anybody. in the world. Yeah. And so think about that from our perspective as creatives, like we're in our own little worlds and our own little niches. And we can take things that we learn from people like Matt, people like Alex, people like, you know, any of our guests that we have on the podcast and people like us, me and Chris, who have our own unique journeys. You can take those things and apply it to your own little pond, I guess you could say. Not the big, the big red ocean, but the little blue pond. And I think if we, if we take those things and apply them to what we're doing and find what parts can we pick out, pick and choose and, and apply those, I think we're all going to be better off. So I already picked up yeah. a few things from Matt that I'm going to push forward with yeah. in some of my businesses. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to some of the other guests we're going to interview on this podcast. Same. I learned a lot from Matt. And that's probably one of my favorite parts about this next version of the podcast, this next season. I'm learning way faster than I did last time. Yeah, we don't, because we were like two, two wet sticks coming together and turning <laughs> to mush when what we got the podcast. Two wet sticks coming together and turning to mush? What? <laughs> It's like the iron sharpens iron thing. Like we were not sharpening each other on a podcast. We oh were just my. dumbing each you, other down. Are you on drugs? <laughs> Clearly not, Chris. <laughs> we were definitely not getting any smarter with it just being me and you on the podcast. Apparently. Every week. Apparently. Yeah. Well, we just got a lot dumber and yeah. it feels good for me to be able to make fun of you a little bit in this episode. Yep. So. And now we're getting smarter. Gradually, gradually smarter. So amazing. Stay tuned for next week, bright and early, 6 a.m. Tuesday morning for our next episode of the Six Figure Creative Podcast.